Good evening. Good evening. I'm Paul Carice. I'm the director of this new academic unit at Arizona State University School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. And I'm very glad to see this great turnout for our seventh event in the school's year-long series on polarization and civil disagreement confronting America's civic crisis. The series includes individual speaker events and interviews, dialogue events, and in February we have a two-day conference. We're glad to have as co-sponsors again our two ASU uh, uh, partners, the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication and the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. This series on polarization and remedies for it is the sequel to our 2017-18 series on free speech and intellectual diversity in higher education and American society. And we're collaborating again with Arizona PBS on recording all the events in the series as they did for the inaugural series. All the episodes air on chapter eight locally and then they're archived on the PBS website. And all of the events in our series and all the other speaker events we have here in the school are archived on the Skettle website. Our aim in all of this is to provide a public forum for civil disagreement and debate. And so I'm always glad to see with us as we have tonight, colleagues from other units at the university, as well as members of the Phoenix community. Uh, we have at least one member of the Board of Regents here. We have some members of the state legislature. We have some other civic leaders. I'm very glad to say that Senator John Kyle is here with us tonight. And the university provost, Mark Searle, is with us. So just a few words about this school's mission and the larger rationale for the series, and then I'll introduce our two distinguished speakers and our guest moderator. The School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership seeks to restore the connection between liberal education and civic education in the American University. We undertake civic education with a broader community as well. Our students discuss great works of civic, economic, and political thought in our courses. And we also organize this series and other speaker events to promote discussion of vital civic and academic issues. And I hope you'll have a chance at some point to look at our display of some items from our Civic Classics collection, a partnership with the University Library to collect some rare items on the themes of the school. The two items we have on display tonight are an 1860 printing of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and then from earlier in the 19th century, an 1826 eulogy by Senator Daniel Webster at the death of Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. And that's there because Jefferson and Adams famously had been friends at one point, then fairly bitter political rivals, and Webster was praising the restoration of their civic friendship. Those works um, are part of the school's effort to reinforce the idea that a return to some fundamental ideas and debates and figures could provide a broader perspective and a calming perspective for both students and citizens in our polarized era. And so to our speakers tonight. Nadine Strassen is the John Marshall Harlan II Professor of Law at New York Law School. She's a widely recognized expert on constitutional law and civil liberties. From 1991 to 2008, she was president of the American Civil Liberties Union and the first woman to head the nation's largest and oldest civil liberties organization. She now serves on the ACLU's National Advisory Council, as well as on the advisory boards of the Electronic Privacy Information Center, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE, and Heterodox Academy. And copies of her most recent book entitled Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship, will be available after tonight's event for a purchase and signing. Uh, the foreword was written by one of our speakers in last year's series, Professor Jeffrey Stone from University of Chicago Law School. Joining her is Judge Michael B. Mukasey, who served as the 81st Attorney General of the United States the nation's chief law enforcement officer from November 2007 to January 2009. He served not only as the head of the US Justice Department in that role, but also advised the president on critical domestic and international law issues. From 1988 to 2006, he served as a district judge in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York and had become chief judge in 2000. He also has served as a United States Assistant United States Attorney for the Southern, Southern District of New York and as an adjunct professor at Columbia School of Law. He's received numerous awards, including the Federal Bar Council's Learned Hand Medal for Excellence in Federal Jurisprudence. And he's now of counsel in the litigation department at Debevoise and Plimpton. 
We have three uh, parts to tonight's event, and the longest will be a dialogue between Professor Strassen and Judge Mukasey, moderated by our friend from the O'Connor College of Law, Professor James Weinstein. Jim is the Dan Cracciolo Chair in the College of Law, a faculty fellow in the Center for Law, Science, and Innovation at ASU, and an associate fellow with the Center for Public Law at the University of Cambridge in England. He's an internationally recognized expert in constitutional law, especially freedom of speech, as well as jurisprudence and legal history. He serves as the faculty advisor to the O'Connor College's new First Amendment Clinic. In part two of the evening after our, our dialogue, uh, we'll have a larger discussion of why it is um, uh, that intellectual and public discourse in the country now often descends to angry denunciation rather than reasoned exchanges, and I will swap out places with Jim for that part. And then in part three, we'll have time for questions from the audience. So please join me in welcoming to the stage for a discussion of how to have a civil conversation across the political divide, Nadine Strassen, Michael Mukasey, and James Weinstein. Well, it's a real pleasure that uh, you, you're both here, and I'm sure it's not just the weather that has uh, brought you. Um, as uh, uh, Professor um, uh, uh, Carriz uh, just mentioned, uh, we'll uh, be having a substantive discussion uh, be, uh, between uh, Judge McKay and Professor Strassen this evening. We'll, we'll discuss two highly controversial subjects, abortion, and the tension between gay rights and freedom of speech and religion. But before we begin the discussion, uh, I'd like to ask both speakers to briefly categorize themselves politically. Professor Strassen. I like to describe myself as a liberal tarian. I am uh, politically definitely on the lib liberal end of the spectrum. In fact, I've been called a bleeding heart liberal on such issues as abortion and affirmative action, the death penalty, uh, the criminal justice system. But I put the Tarian in there because as a civil libertarian, I am absolutely committed to the neutral protection of all fundamental freedoms for all people, no matter who you are, and no matter what you believe, I believe that you are entitled to certain fundamental rights, including freedom of speech and due process of law. And that has separated me from uh, people with whom I agree on a lot of policy issues, including on college campuses where many self-identified liberals are too supportive, from my perspective, of suppressing ideas that they disagree with. I uh, also am politically an independent for exactly the same reason. I'm too independent in my thinking to subscribe to every element of a platform of any political party. And Temperamentally, the ACLU has been a wonderful base for my activism for the reason that the ACLU, although it has been attacked as a liberal organization, has also been attacked as a conservative organization because we do defend freedom for everybody, including people who are themselves anti-civil liberties. And the ACLU and I personally also will collaborate with, sorry, it says no time. I, I don't know how long that's been there. So I'll just end the sentence, um, because this is a content neutral time, place, and manner restriction, so it's not censorship. Um, yay for the law students. Uh, we also will collaborate with any person or any organization any political uh, official on a particular issue that we agree on, even if we strongly disagree on other issues. And I think that is a great prescription, not only for effective advocacy, but for a very happy life, because you get to work with a wide diversity of people. Thank you. Judge McKenzie. Okay. Um, 
to the extent that I'm being asked to affix a label uh, to, to, to the bottom, it's, uh, the label would be conservative, I guess. And um, although I, I share the, the Tarian part of, of uh, Nadine's presentation, I think we agree on a whole lot of those things. Um, again, um, more neo than paleo conservative for those who are making those distinctions. Uh, although I think they're more relevant to foreign policy issues than they are to the issues we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, to the extent that they are relevant to the issues we're talking about tonight, I think that um, my principal belief is that neither of these issues, particularly abortion, but gay rights as well, uh, belongs in the courts. And uh, that they're both principally issues of state law. Um, and that the reason that they're in the courts uh, has to do with what's become kind of a a, a bad uh, symbiosis between judges and politicians. Um, judges, um, I got a minute. Um, ju judges um, have, because of, it's kind of an occupational hazard, they, they come to believe that when people stand up every time they enter and leave the room, it's because of them, not because of the position, um, and um, have taken to inviting everybody to bring their disputes. We will resolve them. We are wise. Just look at how much respect we get. Um, by the same token, politicians are perfectly willing to let issues go to court because that's one less issue that they have to take a stand on. So the, polit the, the, I mean, the courts have spoken. How can you argue with that? So um, the, the judges open their doors to the issues. The politicians are happy to yield. And as a result, we have a lot less democracy. We have a, a withered democracy um, and one that I don't think the founders would, would recognize. Well, I yield the remainder of my time. Well, with that, let's um, get right to it uh, with um, one of the most uh, controversial topics on the political landscape uh, now and for many, many years, abortion. Um, in 1973, in Roe v. Wade, the United, Supre the United States Supreme Court held that a woman has a constitutional right to terminate a pregnancy up until the point that the fetus has become viable. The court defined viability as the ability of the fetus to live outside the womb, including with artificial support. 19 years later, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the court modified uh, several other aspects of Roe, but by a vote of five to four, reaffirmed a woman's right to terminate a, preg a pregnancy prior to fetal viability. Um, uh, so um, now uh, we'll have uh, start with Professor Strassen to uh, tell us uh, whether she thinks the court was correct uh, in um, uh, finding this, uh, well, she's already told you she thought it was. She'll tell you why she thinks the court was correct in finding this right to abortion. And then um, we'll have um, Judge McKenzie uh, tell you why he, uh, elaborate further why he thought the court was not. And then we'll have uh, a discussion between the two of them. Interestingly, and this is not, it's not an issue that has broken down along traditional partisan divides. Interestingly enough, Roe versus Wade was decided seven to two. The majority opinion upholding a woman's reproductive freedom was written by Harry Blackman, uh, a lifelong Republican appointed by a Republican president and uh, joined by other Republican justices. The Casey decision uh, was uh, written, it was very unusual. There was a, a three-part uh, an opinion that was joined by three justices, one of whom was your own hero, Sandra Day O'Connor. Again, a Republican who had been a Republican leader of the state legislature here in Arizona. And as long as I'm speaking about revered Arizona conservative Republicans, let us not forget that Senator Barry Goldwater was a supportive, uh, supporter of reproductive freedom. Now, the argument that's usually made about the uh, Supreme Court upholding this right is that it is not explicitly set out in the Constitution. So what? The framers never intended to limit our constitutionally protected rights to only those that are specifically enumerated. 
To the contrary, they even added the Ninth Amendment in the Bill of Rights to say expressly what had been universally understood, that the enumeration in this Constitution of certain rights does not deny or disparage other rights that are retained by the people. In fact, throughout US history to this day, I am not aware of a single justice who has not supported some unenumerated rights. They disagree about which ones they are. But there are some that we take for granted that are not set out in the Constitution at all. Uh, for example, freedom of association or the right to vote. Uh, as Justice Kennedy, a Republican conservative Catholic, said, along with Justice Brennan, again, a liberal uh, Republican Catholic, um, they both said that the Constitution itself uh, has a textual commitment to open-ended interpretation of rights when it uses such open textured language as due process of law, privileges, or immunities. If the framers had intended to cabin the meaning of those great guarantees of liberty, they would not have used such deliberately open textured language. Thank you. Judge Mukasey. Well, um, as I suggested in my, in, at the beginning, I don't think that um, abortion should ever have presented a constitutional issue. Um, Roe versus Wade itself uh, is really based on an earlier excursion by the Supreme Court in a case called Griswold versus Connecticut. Uh, that was a that was a Connecticut birth control case in which Connecticut, um, you know, ridiculous and rarely enforced, in fact, never enforced statute, barred the use of, of, of contraceptives, and it was necessary to stage a test case, and the test case was duly staged, and and the physician was duly fined a hundred dollars. Went up to the Supreme Court. And an opinion by Justice Douglas, um, he found that the actual text of the amendments to the Constitution um, had about them um, radiations, and that those radiations formed what he called penumbras. And in those penumbras, he found a right to privacy. Now, when a judge who was supposed to uphold the law and the Constitution starts talking about radiations and penumbras, you know, he's making it up as he goes along. And the court has been doing that ever since um, and did it in Roe versus Wade. Um, I'm not suggesting that, and I'm not expressing a view one way or another on, what, on the result in Roe versus Wade, simply that it was not and should not have been a constitutional issue. In fact, I think the country was, as in Griswold, well on its way toward resolving issues relating to uh, abortion before Roe versus Wade. Instead, that conversation was cut off, and we have a, um, a really embittered um, atmosphere as a result. Now, I shouldn't knock that because it's really helped my party, the Republican Party. Um, it were it not for Roe versus Wade, I think it would be difficult for us to, to have um, very many adherents. Um, but what I'm suggesting is that you've got to be careful about constitutionalizing rights um, in, in this area, because at some point, Somebody is going to notice that um, if you can't abort a viable fetus, then maybe that fetus is a person. Um, and we're going to have litigation over the personhood of unborn children. Understand, I think that poses moral problems, but those moral problems should not be resolved in court. This is an issue that should be resolved by the culture, not by judges, who I think are least equipped to do it. Professor Strassel, would you like to? I would love to. <laughs> so Griswold versus Connecticut involved a state statute, and there were uh, many states that had these laws at the time, that literally made it a crime even for a married couple to use contraception in their own bedroom. Think of the implications of that. The government could send law enforcement officers 
into the marital bedroom to stop people from using birth control. Would we tolerate a result that said that is constitutional for the government to do? Not consistent with my view of the liberty that we all cherish. Um, in fact, uh, with all due respect to Judge Mukasey, and you know when you start with that phrase, you know you're going to disagree end with the disagreement. I, 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 I hate that phrase. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, with well, usually, but I do I do usually, respect you, usually, but I disagree no, with you. It usually means with as much respect as is necessary for me to get away with what I'm about to say, <laughs> but no more. And, and what I'm about to say, I have a good source, which is the United States Supreme Court, which has a long line of cases going back way before Griswold versus. Connecticut, uh, starting in the 19th century, accelerating in the early 20th century, of reading uh, one provision in particular in the 14th Amendment as um, embodying the concept that government's power to limit fundamental traditional rights that we have taken for granted in this country that government may not do so. Uh, and the provision that the US, and, and so the first such, uh, I think the most famous uh, such case that it did so early on in the 20th century was the right of parents to educate their own children, including the right of parents to send their children to parochial schools, uh, the right of parents to have their children taught a foreign language. Again, there's no provision in the Constitution that expressly says uh, government may not force parents to send Catholic parents to send their kids to a public school. Government may not stop parents from having their kids taught a foreign language, but it was good enough for the uh, justices way back then to say that there are certain rights that are so fundamental that they are implicit in this deliberately capacious term in the Constitution, uh, due process of law. I also want to say there's another provision that was added after the Civil War uh, that says that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. And many of us think that that was the provision that should have been the one that was the basis for protecting these unenumerated rights. And I want to say here in Arizona, uh, one of the great advocates of that position is now on your state Supreme Court, namely Clint Bullock. And even though he and I disagree with each other on many, many issues, we agree on that. And by the way, Justice Clarence Thomas has argued that the Privileges and Immunities Clause should protect unenumerated rights. Interestingly enough, he concluded that some of those unenumerated rights belong to unborn persons, so that does create difficulties. Uh, Judge uh, McKenzie, could I ask if you'd like to respond to Professor Strassen's point about that these rights really are uh, protected by the Ninth Amendment or due process or privileges or immunity? Well, um, the Ninth Amendment, no. Um, due process, I mean, if, if this is part of what's now called substantive due process. Um, substantive due process is the vegetarian hamburger of constitutional law. If somebody offers you a vegetarian hamburger, you're not entirely sure what you're going to get, but the one thing you're damn sure not going to get is a hamburger. Um, <laughs> substantive due process has nothing to do with process. If you take a look at the rights that are guaranteed in the 14th Amendment, there's due process, there's equal protection, and there's privileges and immunities. Now, the way it should have been, in my view, and I think probably in the Dean's as well, um, due process has to do with the way things get done. And the way things get done is largely what happens in court. Equal protection, the, it's the executive that goes about protecting people, which leaves privileges and immunities to cover the things that legislatures do and pass um, and that, that, are, that are substantive rights. That should have been covered by the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Regrettably, um, a series of cases, the, the slaughterhouse cases, um, post-Civil War, read out the Privileges and Immunities Clause and made it meaningless. What they said essentially is, the Privileges and Immunities Clause protects only certain specific rights that are yours by virtue of, by virtue of being a citizen of the United States. It doesn't protect your state rights. 
which is kind of like saying you get to belong to a club, but you don't get all the rights of membership. You get only the right to help clean up. Um, the, um, so the, the slaughterhouse cases have been on a list of to be reversed for some time. And I'm hoping that um, if not in my lifetime, at least in yours, we will see the reversal of the slope. May I agree with that. And that was actually the op-ed that Clinton and I wrote together when that issue was before the Supreme Court. If I can, since um, uh, Michael has mentioned, we agreed we could all be on a first name basis. Um, since Michael has mentioned the Equal Protection Clause, I think it's really interesting that in that 1992 decision, which was co-authored by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, for the very first time, the court strongly hinted that gender equality could be an alternative rationale for the right to choose an abortion. And that was an argument that somebody with a very different political uh, perspective, namely Ruth Bader Ginsburg, had argued. She was one of a number of liberals who were critical of Roe's rationale. She was then head of the ACLU's Women's Rights Project. And she argued that the decision would better have been grounded on a concept of gender equality. And so that theme came out in 1992 that if women do not have the ability to make decisions about when and whether to uh, become mothers, then we can never have true, full equality in the public sphere. Again, a Republican, Sandra Day O'Connor, subscribing to that uh, view. Uh, we're out of time for this segment, though I'd like to give Judge McCasey just a, a, a second to respond to that, if you'd like. Um, we could pass on to that. Okay, so um, with the retirement of Justice uh, Kennedy, who was in the majority in the 5-4 Casey decision, and uh, his replacement with uh, Justice Kavanaugh, there's been a lot of speculation about the fate of, um, of uh, Roe's central holding to a pre-viability uh, abortion. And if President Trump is able to replace a liberal member of the court, um, with another appointment, the, 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 uh, the likelihood that Roe would be overruled uh, becomes uh, much more likely. Uh, if Roe were overruled, then once again, state legislatures would have to decide, would have the power to decide whether to prohibit or to permit abortion. So I'd like to ask each speaker uh, to tell us how, if well, well, we're overruled, and if they were a member of a state legislature, how they would uh, vote on abortion. This time we'll begin with Judge Bukhese. Well, um, regrettably, I'm, I'm law trained, so um, that's a bit of a handicap because this is a decision that I think um, is going to have to be resolved in the culture uh, rather than in the courts and rather than in the legislature. Um, it involves ethics, it involves medicine, um, it involves law marginally, uh, but there are a whole lot of issues uh, relating to the question of the advisability or the, the, the availability of abortion. Um, my own state um, has decided to anticipate the possibility that Roe might not, might not survive, which I think is, is, is absurd. It's gonna survive for a long time. We're in a Casey, uh, atmosphere, not, we're, we're not talking about Roe, yes or no. But um, my own state, New York, um, just legalized abortion for the entire period of, uh, of gestation, up to and including the ninth month, um, which I think um, is frankly barbaric. Um, if that road leads to uh, places like um, uh, the, the Philadelphia doctor who um, was aborting infants um, and snipping their, their spinal columns um, and was convicted of six counts of, actually seven counts of murder, six of, of infants uh, and one of a mother. Um, the, um, uh, it leads us to um, where uh, a man named Ernst Rudin uh, practiced. He was a, he was a, a German who, um, wrote the justification for the eugenics laws um, in Nazi Germany, um, headed up that effort. Was never brought to trial, by the way, at Nuremberg. He escaped with a 500 mark fine. 
but he was the, the person who um, led that effort. Um, you start legalizing um, abortion through nine months, and um, that's where you wind up. I, I, I want to respond to so many of these really interesting points, but I want to start with a point that Michael made one question ago, which was about the politics of this issue. Because if somebody's going to be politically gamesmening, they might w want abortion to be, um, a pro-choice person might want abortion to be outlawed because that gives a, a political platform. Just the way the uh, Republican Party recently, more recently, benefited from the backlash against Roe versus Wade. You had Jeffrey Stone here as a speaker, I understand. He wrote this amazing book called Sex and the Constitution, in which he traces a very surprising history that until quite recently, the Republican Party around the country uh, was supportive of abortion rights, including Barry Goldwater here in Arizona, Ronald Reagan, when he was governor of California, signed the most liberal abortion law in the country. Democrats, because they had a large base of urban Catholic supporters, tended to be anti-abortion. And it was a deliberate political switch to recruit uh, different supporters into the party that cynically the Republican Party, and I'm not saying that critically, I mean it wasn't because of moral reasons, it was for political reasons, very successfully, that they changed their position. Now I do think it is an extremely important issue of morality and ethics, I agree with Michael, and health and equality, and one of the things that I think was brilliant and just about Roe versus Wade and Casey is that both of those opinions rejected extreme arguments that were put to the court. One extreme argument was that abortion should be legal until the minute of live birth. That argument was actually made uh, by some of the friends of the court and by Jane Roe herself, not by the ACLU, not by Planned Parenthood. That position was rejected. But the extreme other position, the state of Texas and many others argued that abortion should always be illegal from the minute of conception on. And I think that is equally unjust and wrong. And I think uh, the point of viability is absolutely the best point from a moral and health and gender equality perspective. I'm interested in, um, in what you think would be the appropriate restrictions. Um, one has, has been, that's been upheld by the court, I believe, is parental notification. Um, I'm interested in what you would think of, uh, and this is in a kind of extreme position, um, a requirement that anyone who wants to have an abortion after a certain period of time be required to have a sonogram before she does it. I think that if there is a medical justification or some justification so that is not just a pretext to make it harder for somebody to exercise it's that not, right. It's, I think it's a more, I think the, if, if the it's a matter is not, if it's not medical. It, if it's, it's a matter it's of give, if it's a matter of giving information, uh, enhancing informed consent. I would not oppose that. But I also want to make another point, Michael, which I make. I often do debates on this subject because I think that there is so much common ground, and I'm so heartbroken that it seems not to be um, promoted as much as I think it should be. I don't know anybody who is pro abortion. I don't know, right? <laughs> I don't know anybody who opposes the idea that all pregnancies should be intended pregnancies, that all choices should be based on you know, real options. The vast majority of abortions in this country are 
uh, by poor women who have less access to contraception, who have less access to sex information, and who have less access to health care and other care for their children. I think it's, it's tragic if somebody really wants to have the child but can't because she doesn't have the economic uh, support. So I think all of us should uh, co collaborate to make sure that all pregnancies are intended and all people who want to add to their families should have societal support in doing that. It's interesting to note that there may be some agreement here in terms of sonograms even for informational uh, uh, reasons. Uh, Judge McKenzie, did you want to search for some more uh, agreement or disagreement or uh, we could... Uh, I don't think I have to search for disagreement. We've got plenty of that going. The, the, um, um, I, was, I was presented the, 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 the point about a sonogram um, largely because I think what we have to do is face up to what we're actually doing um, and look it straight in the eye rather than skip past it. Um, the, um, it's, it's, it's easy to talk about termination of a pregnancy in a very clinical way, uh, but it's harder, um, and that's the point of my suggestion about the sonogram. Um, it's, it's harder if you're looking at what appears to be a human being. What I object to about that, I understand the positive intent, but to me it also smacks of paternalism, as if this woman is not aware of the consequences you can have, you can have of a this choice. Done by a, yeah. a female gynecologist. Yeah. No, but I'm saying, I'm saying that I'm no. Oh, okay. But Ma maternalism. Uh, then. Maternalism. Uh, better. Condescension toward the woman who is pregnant, uh, uh, assuming that she is not taking this choice very seriously. You know, all the studies that I've read and briefs have now been submitted in the Supreme Court by women who have had abortions who talk about uh, they're very aware of what a serious issue it is. It's not something that is taken lightly and it's, it's often seen as uh, the less tragic of two tragic options. Well, maybe there wasn't uh, the agreement that I thought there was. <laughs> we talk longer we could uh, find that, uh, something else I'd li like to point out is that um, maybe, I hope I'm right about this one, but Judge McKay's constitutional position seems to be um, somewhat different than your policy position, which I think is um, uh, often a, a good thing, and I wish that... Uh, it, is, it is different, and um, I think that the Constitution solves a lot of problems, um, but it, that doesn't mean that every good thing that there is in this world is prescribed by the Constitution and every bad thing is forbidden by it. Um, we have free will, uh, we have a political, the Constitution establishes a political system for us to make intelligent choices and it doesn't tell us what those choices are. Um, it allows us to make choices, it provides a means and making those choices matters of law I think restricts people's ability to make decisions for themselves, among other things. We're pretty much out the, of time. Oh, Do you sorry. want to say something very quickly and we'll move on? The opposite is also true. The three justices, including O'Connor, who uh, voted to uphold the right of abortion, uh, expressly said, as a matter of our own personal moral and religious convictions, we think abortion is wrong. But in our capacity as justices, it is inappropriate for us to impose our personal views of morality upon the general public. So you agree that there could be a separation between what the Constitution requires and what's good and right. And so good. See, we did find agreement. <laughs> Maybe coming from the opposite, but OK. I'll, I'll, <laughs> um, all right, let's turn to another highly uh, controversial topic. And, that's the implication for free speech and uh, religious liberty um, from laws forbidding discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation in places of public accommodation. The issue was, um, these issues were uh, squarely raised in the Supreme Court uh, last term in a case called Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Rights Commission in that case, a devoutly Christian baker claimed that a Colorado law that would have required him to make a custom wedding cake for the marriage of a same-sex couple 
violated his right to free speech as well as his right to free exercise of religion. Um, the Supreme Court, not, not to put too fine a point out of it, uh, punted, dodged these difficult issues, instead narrowly ruling that the commission's treatment of the Baker's case evinced impermissible hostility towards religion. So I'd like to ask the speakers to tell us what they think of the ba Baker's claims, how these claims should have been decided if they had reached the merits of them. And let's take the free speech uh, issue first and begin with um, Professor Strauss. The ACLU actually represented the gay couple who went into this bakery and as soon as they said that it was to uh, celebrate their wedding, they were told by this um, devout bakery owner that he would not make any product to celebrate a same-sex wedding because that was inconsistent with his religious beliefs. Now I want to say I personally and the ACLU as an organization strongly supports freedom of speech and freedom of religion and strongly opposes government putting words in the mouths of somebody that is inconsistent with their religious or conscientious beliefs. I'm so proud of the fact, for example, that way back in 1943, we represented the Jehovah's Witnesses in West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett, who refused to salute the American flag because that violated their religious belief that that was inconsistent with the Second Commandment, saluting a graven image. However, that is not what this case is about. The baker, Jack Phillips, was completely free to say whatever he wanted, to express his religious beliefs in any way that he wanted, including posting a sign in his bakery saying, you know, I think that marriage is only between a man and a woman. What he is not free to do is hang out his shingle, open a commercial business that is generally open to the public, but to say, I am not going to provide my services or my products to particular people because of who they are. That is the exact same argument that was made by opponents of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. I know, I wrote an ACLU brief in one of those cases in which uh, it happened to involve Bob Jones University who said, we have a deep-seated religious belief against interracial dating. And although the ACLU supports their uh, free exercise right and their free speech rights to voice those views, they may not implement them through actual discriminatory conduct. So uh, the baker, again, he could have put up a sign saying, uh, the only reason I am providing services to same-sex uh, couples is because the law is forcing me to do that. And no reasonable person would see his provision of equal treatment because of a non-discrimination law would see that as his mouthing a belief that is inconsistent with what he believed. Um, this was not about providing a product. Um, this was about providing a service. And it was a classic, I think, free speech case that the court could have decided on free speech grounds. I'm interested in why it is they decided it on free exercise grounds instead. I happen to think that it was to command a large majority instead of a small majority, um, and so as, to so as to essentially punt to another day the time to decide it on free speech grounds. Um, it seems to me that if new dancing is speech, then designing a cake um, is just as much speech, and it is just as much compulsion um, to require that somebody do that as it is to require that they recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, it is, it's a fine thing to say, I'm, I'm pledging allegiance. I'm only doing it because the government's requiring me to do it. I don't really believe that. Um, this, this was not a situation in which somebody was refusing to provide a product that he had already prepared. That's a, that's a very different thing. Um, it's much more analogous, I think, to a band being asked to play at a, at a, at a same-sex wedding, deciding they will not 
provide music to a same-sex wedding. Um, exactly the same kind of thing. Um, they decided it instead on free exercise grounds, largely because the, the, um, the oxymoronically named Colorado Rights Commission spent most of their time abusing Mr. Phillips, insulting him, jeering at his, at his religious beliefs, and uh, the court found that, that he hadn't gotten a fair hearing. Okay. So the question is not whether the product or the service has some expressive component, to use a cliche, that proves too much. Everything we do has some expressive component. That doesn't mean it can't be regulated. To take an extreme example, you know, committing a political assassination is no doubt conveying a viewpoint that you disagree, dislike that person that you're assassinating, disagree with that person's ideas. Of course, the government can still outlaw it because what it is punishing is the conduct, not the associated message. In this case, it is so clear that his message, his belief is not being impeded in any direct way at all. He is encouraged to express it in any way he wants, including signs on the windows. I really don't think it's necessary. I don't think most people would see that somebody's baking a cake and it's a cake for a gay wedding, therefore he must be supporting gay weddings. I don't think most people would read that into it. Um, so the, the point is that the once nobody forced him to open his doors to the public what, and nobody forced him to provide wedding cakes. He could decide, for example, I'm not going to bake cakes for weddings. I'm going to bake cakes for other uh, occasions. But once he decides that he is going to provide wedding cakes to some people, he may not deny it to other people because of who they are, including their sexual orientation or their race. Can I ask you if it would be different if, he, if, if the customer said, wanted him to write on the cake, God bless this wedding or God bless same sex? Would that be different? Again, the standard is equality. If he would provide that message to other customers, then he may not deprive particular customers of that message. So in fact, um, part of the case history in Colorado was um, somebody else who had gone to various bakeries and asked them to bake cakes that had messages that were very disparaging of LGBT individuals, and the bakeries refused to put that message on the cakes because those bakery and, and the person who uh, wanted those messages, it was consistent with his religious beliefs. Uh, the Colorado Civil Rights Commission and the US Supreme Court affirmed this, said that is not a violation of this public accommodation laws. He is not being denied that message because of who he is, namely his religious beliefs as he claimed, Rather, those bakeries were saying, we're not going to put that particular message on any cake, no matter who asked for it, whether they're an atheist or a Muslim or a Catholic or, you know, just, a, you know, a, a, a political radical. So in this case, it's just a matter of equality. Um, again, the baker um, didn't refuse to bake the cake because of who asked him to bake it. He refused to bake the cake because of what the occasion was. He would have refused it to somebody who said, I'm taking this cake to a wedding of my gay friends and I want you to put thus and such on the cake. Secondly, it's not a question of what other people think. It's a question of what he thinks while he's doing it. And that's what makes it compelled speech. Um, selling products is one thing. Preparing something, putting creativity into it is something else. Judge, can I ask you, would uh, your position hold if uh, someone did not want to bake a cake for an interracial marriage. Yes. And, and he was willing to, I mean, he would then suffer um, the economic consequences of having to get around town that this is somebody who won't bake a cake for an interracial right. marriage. So I don't think that, you know, baking a cake is inherently expressive the way saluting a flag is, but even assuming... Or the way, or the way new dancing is, for example. It, exactly. And even assuming for the sake of argument it is, here's a basic constitutional law principle, no right is absolute except 
um, maybe you know freedom to believe but not not to necessarily express your even freedom of speech is not absolute even free exercise of religion is not absolute these rights may be limited when the limitation is necessary to promote a countervailing goal of compelling importance that's Con law students know and love this as the so-called strict scrutiny standard. And every court, to the best of my knowledge, that has grappled with this issue, including right here in Arizona, where the same issue is percolating through your state courts, has concluded that even if we assume that this is protected speech, government still may limit it because the limitation is necessary to promote non-discrimination and equality in the public commercial sphere. To say that because his beliefs are um, affronted by having to serve an interracial couple, by having to provide a cake that's going to be used for uh, a gay wedding, is to undermine the equal citizenship and dignity of these essential equal members of our society. Judge, a, a concluding remark? Um, I think the, the compulsion here um, is, is easily resolved by going to another bakery. All right. With that Solomon-like uh, ruling, uh, let's uh, take the second uh, uh, issue uh, that was in the case, which was uh, uh, not addressed. And that's the um, free exercise claim, not the one, not the hostility claim, but um, uh, the uh, Baker wanting uh, an, uh, uh, an exemption under the free exercise clause. Um, and by way of background, um, I should mention a case called Employment Division versus Smith, uh, which uh, by five to four vote, uh, in 1990 in a, a, a decision uh, which was written by Justice Scalia with uh, liberals like Justice Stevens joining, five members of the court said that when a law of general applicability that is neutral to religion, like a, a law banning illicit drug use, is at issue, it doesn't even implicate the free exercise clause. So in uh, that case, the court said that um, a, a, a Native American who was using peyote um, could not claim a free exercise exemption from Oregon's law banning drugs, including uh, peyote. Now, um, Smith has been roundly criticized by many, including uh, members of the current court, and so that too may case too may be overruled. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear uh, what our um, speakers think about uh, whether Smith, the Smith case should be overruled, and if so, whether they think uh, that uh, propri proprietors like the baker in the um, masterpiece uh, uh, case should be uh, allowed exemptions under the free exercise clause from uh, 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 having to uh, uh, engage in activity that they burdens their religion, like uh, baking a cake for a same-sex uh, um, uh, wedding. And so we will begin this discussion with Judge Mukasey. Okay. Um, I don't think courts generally, um, judges generally, ought to be dealing in exemptions. Um, that's not what they're there for. They're there to enforce laws. Um, there, I am a firm believer in the police power. Uh, I think Smith was correctly decided. Um, I'm hoping it doesn't get reversed. The, um, it, it, is, it is a reasonable exercise of the police power not to, not to permit the use of, of uh, uh, hallucinogens uh, by anybody for religious reasons or not. Um, there, are snake, there are snake handlers who believe uh, that it is their duty to handle serpents because so saith the Bible. Um, there's a, there are laws against snake handling. You can't do it. Um, it's a reasonable exercise of the police power. Um, and, but I, of, of all people, I don't think it's judges who ought to be dealing in exemptions. 
if anybody ought to be dealing in exemptions, it's legislatures that are responsible and responsive to the people who elected them. I have been told by the uh, powers that be that we have uh, only five minutes left for this whole uh, section. So um, if you'd like to respond quickly to that, and then I want to say just yeah. have, get your views of legislative exemptions. And this is so interesting because this is an issue where I, I am on the same side as cultural conservatives and advocates of religious liberty, including the uh, Jack Phillips of the world. I do very strongly believe that free exercise of religion along with freedom of speech is a right that is protected against majoritarian political power, right? As the Supreme Court famously said in the, in the flag salute case, uh, our rights are not subject to the ballot box. The purpose of those rights is to protect against the so-called tyranny of the majority and the function, especially of the federal courts who are insulated from polit majoritarian political pressures, is to be there to protect the rights of unpopular, unpowerful minority groups, including religious minorities. That said, it's still not an absolute right, and what happened in the Arizona case, which has now gone before uh, your intermediate court of appeals, is Arizona has a state statute that does protect free exercise of religion as it used to be protected under the U.S. Constitution as a matter of state statutory law, and I agree with the judges of that court when they said that right is still not violated because of this countervailing um, concern to protect the dignity and equality of same-sex couples and their marriages. And to say, oh, let them go to another bakery, that reminds me of you know, the infamous Green Book during racial segregation. Oh, you can thumb through the Green Book and find a hotel or a restaurant that will deign to serve you if you happen to be African American. Are we going to have a lavender book for bakeries that will serve uh, gay people and their weddings? I certainly hope it doesn't come to that. J Judge uh, responded and also if you'd like to say something about your views of whether there should be statutory exemptions. I think statutory exemptions rather than judge-made exemptions, as I said before. But uh, we're not talking about a lavender book for people who want to simply buy cakes. We're talking about going to another bakery to get somebody to design a particular cake for a particular event. I think it's a very easy, bright line to maintain, um, and it allows a person to do what he or she thinks uh, is appropriate under their religion, or refrain from doing it. All right, well, with that, um, I could say something about going to another bakery would be let, let them, them eat cake, th th or let them not eat cake, yeah. is the, okay, but let's um, ca call uh, this part of the program um, uh, to an end, uh, and, um, and, the, and I just would like to say that I think that uh, this discussion shows that uh, th there can be uh, useful uh, civil discussions about the most uh, and productive in, uh, uh, about the most divisive uh, issues in society today. And um, now I'd like to welcome back to the stage uh, Professor Carice, uh, uh, who will lead a um, meta level discussion of how we ever got to the point in this country that we need to demonstrate how people can have such a discussion. And, and then we'll also ask um, what we can do to remedy uh, the sorry situation that we're in where these kind of productive and civil conversations are so hard to come by. Thank you, moderator. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jim. I snuck up behind you. You snuck it. And, um, uh, you haven't got rid of me yet. I'll be back He'll to be moderate back. the uh, uh, audience uh, He'll be back. Okay. So while I'm getting seated, I will take a moment to thank Jim, not only for moderating, but also for helping us conceive of this event and thinking of Professor Strassen and, and Judge McKaysey as the two people we could have um, for the event. Now I'll turn from being very civil to being the devil's advocate here. And my, my opening question is, uh, a, comes from a reflection of the more recent political and intellectual culture in the country, which is that 
this discussion between two lawyers, lawyer and a judge, very interesting as a matter of legal niceties, legal principles, role of courts. But as you said, there are serious, fundamental, moral, political issues. And if you really believed in your moral, political principles, you would be denouncing the opposite party. You would have contempt for the other party. Otherwise, how do you show that you really believe in those fundamental moral and political principles? So start with Professor Strauss. I think that uh, this kind of came out in my comments about abortion. I hope it's clear that I feel very strongly about reproductive freedom and gender equality. Uh, but, or I should say, and I am so eager to find common ground. I do believe that everybody has a reverence for life, and I do believe that everybody respects women's health and gender equality and wants to limit, you know, maximize individual freedom of choice. So in that sense, the two warring slogans, pro-choice and pro-life, are unfair and oversimplified. So I think it's really important to, fo to not minimize our disagreements, not mask them over, but don't let them obscure the larger constructive project of finding common ground where we can jointly advance a goal that is shared by us. We may disagree, we will disagree uh, at the margins, but that should not stop us from uh, making as much progress that is mutually acceptable as possible. You said that if we really believed what we say we believe, we would be denouncing the other person. Um, that doesn't necessarily follow. Uh, we would be making as effective arguments as we can, um, but most particularly, we would be addressing particular situations um, with particular people um, and resolving it ba based on, not based on slogans, not based on one side uh, saying it favors the right to life. Who doesn't favor the right to life? Who doesn't favor a right to choose? That's not, a, that's not an argument. That's, a, that's, a, that's an invitation to cut off argument. It's an invitation to cut off analysis. Um, if you want it, that's why I said I thought it was a mistake to constitutionalize this issue because it, it, it prevents us from facing each particular situation in, a se in the setting of, with other citizens and with people we can confront on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, as we were talking before um, about, about uh, this, this question of, of denouncing the opposition and back in, back in, uh, in 1938, George Orwell uh, wrote a letter to Stephen Spender, the poet. He said you know, that he regretted having met him because um, he used to denounce Spender as what he called a parlor pink um, and as a, as a, as a communist and, it, and would caricature him. Um, but now that he met him, now that he had a human interchange with him, he couldn't do that anymore. And he regretted the fact that he couldn't do it um, and it was uncomfortable doing it in the future. I think the same is true of people dealing with issues like this. Um, if you deal with a particular issue um, in a particular setting, whether it's with a doctor and a patient, um, a husband and a wife, um, you can deal with it a lot more effectively than you can slinging slogans. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I, I wanted to say that it's quite well known that the United States Supreme Court, despite very, very bitter disagreements, right, and some pretty insulting statements being made in one opinion about authors of another opinion, all of the justices say that they have very cordial, mutually respectful working relationships. About a year ago, uh, Justice Ginsburg did me the honor of uh, inviting me to conduct a public interview of her. And I asked her about that and whether the court could be a model for Congress or other bodies in the sense of uh, people who do have to deal with a common problem, right? They have no choice. Um, they're not at all camouflaging their disagreements, but they still have mutual respect because they accept that they are all committed to the same general goals, right? 
liberty, and justice for all. Well, as, as a historical matter, uh, Justice Ginsburg and Justice Scalia were very close friends uh, socially um, and in every other way. Uh, obviously, they were pol they're polar opposites on legal issues, and um, that's a, it's a perfect illustration of, of uh, what the professor just said. So I felt a duty to be the skeptic as a test, test this uh, proposition, but I, I'm in, in general agreement with what you just said. But let me, let me uh, pose the converse now. I, if we have seen tonight the advantage of having two people who have some fundamental disagreements, nonetheless having an extended conversation, hearing each other out. The converse question is, what, stepping beyond the courts and the law, what are the costs to America's political civic fabric? What are the costs to our capacity to govern ourselves, to make reasonable policy, if that earlier principle I mentioned were, were to dominate, as it, it, in certain sectors of our life is dominating now, that you must, you must denounce people who disagree with you on fundamental points. You perhaps shouldn't even have a conversation. You shouldn't dignify that person by, by having a conversation. What are the larger political civic costs of, of that ethic taking over? I'd love to ask Senator Kyle. I mean, it seems as if it would be impossible to uh, achieve legislation to do the public work if you're only going to be speaking to people that you agree with, right? And then we're going to lose an opportunity to move forward on even of issues of the most critical importance to the vast majority of people in this country. And if I can add, I want to allude to something that I said earlier about um, the ACLU. We've been applauded by conservatives who are opposed to many positions we take, as well as liberals who are opposed to many positions we take because of this approach of we're not going to have a, a litmus test. You have to agree with us on everything or we're not going to collaborate with you. So the progress that we're able to make is by being willing to overlook differences on even really important issues. If on this particular issue we agree and we can advance and uh, a point that is of common concern. So you can make more progress that way. But I also want to bring it to the individual level. I also was very good friends with Justice Scalia. I like to say, uh, not despite our disagreements, but because of them. Because of our strong disagreements, we were invited to debate each other all over the world. We met each other through debates, as indeed I've met Michael through debates, and then we got to like each other as human beings and to enjoy each other's company. And that makes life so much richer, just as we value diversity among our friends and colleagues in race, religion, every other identity factor. The same is true if we can have friendships with people who have different religious and political beliefs. Well, um, I think when we were having a conversation before with one of your local radio stations, um, Professor Strassen pointed out that we've had um, a long history in this country of, of really violent disagreements. Back in the early days when, of, of pamphleteers, they denounced each other in, in highly personal terms. But what they did not have, what we do, what we do have, and what I think is unfortunate, um, is um, people retreating to the internet where they can be alone and um, with only like-minded people if they choose to do so. Um, and there's an increasing amount of that that I think is very different qualitatively and obviously quantitatively from what it was in the early days. And we need to be, that's a, that's a, hard, that's a hard nut to crack. Okay, at this point I'm gonna invite um, Professor Weinstein back on the stage to moderate a discussion. I'll, while he's doing that, I'll just say, in the conference we have coming February 22nd and 23rd, we have a whole panel of uh, journalists and academics on the topic of the media environment, social media environment, and in what way it's an exacerbating factor in, in uh, polarization. So we uh, have a microphone here in the center aisle. Uh, Jim is going to uh, yield the, uh, field the questions and, and uh, moderate the discussion here. Um, but make sure that you tell them that questions. Yes, yes, and so the judge is reminding me uh, the rules of the court. 
um, that uh, we, we do have two rules about uh, uh, brief questions that we solicit from the audience, that they should be brief and it should actually be a question. Uh, one, other rule, <laughs> one other rule, I would ask the first two questions to be posed by students. Since we are at a university, do you have any brave students who want to step forward? And we have a single subject, one question that you all need to No, last, last call for students to step forward. Students of all ages, sure. Nobody, nobody's going to get called on and nobody's going to take your name. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Well, we, I think we may have two undergraduate students. Uh, I should have been, some yeah. Uh, and, and then the third student can come forward. Okay, Jim. First Hello, my name is John. Um, I'm a senior here at ASU. I'm almost 60 years old. Um, I liked your word, libertarian. I'm going to take it. But last semester, I took a philosophy of constitutional law class. The instructor said that um, most Supreme Court justices do not believe that the Ninth Amendment is applicable in any of their decisions. Do you agree or disagree with that? John, I think what the professor was saying is that it has not been the basis for a majority opinion. It's just stating a principle. Uh, but it's the general principle of interpretation influences many decisions, including Roe versus Wade and Griswold versus Connecticut. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty important one. I've always liked the Ninth Amendment myself. Good for you. Good luck in your studies. Judge uh, Mukasey, did you want to say something about the... Um, um, I'll take my constitutional law class and I'll tell you why I disagree with Professor Strauss and <laughs> with the Ninth Amendment and why the court has um, said... Um, yes, please. All right. So in this current environment where there seems to be a, a great amount of political accelerationism as each side increasingly gets more radical, it feels as if one is, sh is stuck to a side which one is most strongly aligned with. I feel that way myself in that I'm, I cannot simply support the Democrats for on many issues. It's a hard line for me. So how then can we perhaps restore the moderate elements to the party so that way we can start having these? Because uh, many of the prior speakers have made this exact point that it is the death of the moderates within each party that has caused this. So perhaps would either of you have any strategies for restoring the moderate factions within each party? Well, I think we've, we have a long history of um, parties running to the left in the case of the Democrats, to the right in the case of the Republicans in primary elections, and then going to the center when it comes to the, when it comes to the general. Um, regrettably, what's happened is that most of the energy um, has come from the extremes on both parties, and that's, I think, what is keeping uh, that process from ripening uh, in, in, in general elections. I would just say you have to do it yourself. I mean, the party is a reflection of the people who are activists within it. I think the phenomenon that Michael describes, which I agree with, is that those who tend to be the most active are the ones who have the strongest views. And just as you have a responsibility to vote, you have a responsibility to be even more active. You will make a difference. You can make a difference. Also, I think um, we shouldn't underestimate the value of, of, of parties and becoming affiliated with parties. And people say, well, I can't agree with them across the board, so I'm not going to join a party. Um, you don't get any place simply standing on a soapbox and espousing a particular point of view. You get a lot further joining up with people you can agree with on most points, getting done as much as you can. And obviously, you're going to be opposed to the people on the other side who themselves disagree on some points, but support most points. We, what you don't want, I think, is a cacophony of voices, everybody standing for purity of his or her own view. We, we have a panel on political parties at that conference I keep mentioning. So come back, February 22nd and 23rd. We have a discussion. Of it. I wanted to ask about my Trump supporter neighbor who I talk to all the time and believes anyone working in this institution is a communist, but I was intrigued by the talk of the culture just making decisions rather than courts, and I've often heard our country 
is more litigious than others and so forth. And so I went back to 1962 when I started dating my wife, who for some reason is still with me. Um, and uh, our marriage was illegal in Arizona at that time. And uh, two years went by and before we got married and in that period the state took the law off the books. But had we gone to one of the other 16 to 18 states that still had anti-miscegenation laws, then we would have run into, I think, the same problem as many of the LGBTQ community did, does of hospital visitations, should anything happen, and so forth and so on. And the, some, of, some of you up there might remember back when you could look through Life magazine every month or look at TV if you had one um, all day and never see a black face. The culture was quite okay with that state of affairs. We could have waited for another 10, 20 years for the culture to change, to okay our marriage, to sanction it, or I could have done as, gone to another bakery, found another girl, but I chose to stay. So, so there's question. a question here somewhere, yes. I know. Yeah, and what do you do is... about that? What do you do about, you want the culture to change these things, and the culture is not changing fast enough for us to get married in time for her to have babies. Thank you. Um, I think there's a, there's a world of difference between litigating issues like that and litigating issues like buying cake. Um, and nobody, nobody disputes the propriety and the morality of litigating those statutes. However, I would also point out that when civil rights workers went south back in 1962, they were told to avoid having interracial couples walk side by side for fear of exciting, exciting the, the, the locals. Um, it was a very delicate issue at the time. Luckily, it's not anymore. I, one of the courts um, in one of these cases about denying equal services to people based on their sexual orientation said that these cases are no more about the right to buy a cake than the 1960s civil rights cases uh, with sit-ins at lunch counters were about the right to buy a sandwich. There is something much more profound at stake. And thank you for sharing that very moving experience with us. Hi, um, I wanted to go back to earlier in the evening, eugenics was brought up. Um, when I think eugenics, I think you know one group saying, these characteristics are superior to all others, and in imp imposing that, you know, trying to impose that will on everyone. So I wanted, wondered if you would address this idea, like abortion, that's an individual's right, you know, sh to choose. How, is there really a connection? And also it brings up in my mind this concept of slippery slope. That seems to be the argument when you invoke eugenics as, a reason to um, deny in a, a woman's right to choose. And I wondered if you would delve more into those kinds of concepts. Okay, so I do, uh, I, this is again why I so respect the, the way the Supreme Court has wrestled with this issue. Justice Blackman, who had represented the Mayo Clinic as a lawyer before he became a judge, uh, spent the entire summer, famously, after the Supreme Court argument, in the library of the Mayo Clinic, and he studied all of the medical literature, and he studied philosophy, and he studied religion, and what he saw was that no matter what perspective you were taking, a scientific perspective, an ethical perspective, a moral perspective, a religious perspective, there was profound disagreement among people. There are even, there's an organization called Catholics for Choice. There's an organization called the Religious Coalition for Choice. People with, you know, devout religious beliefs, even where their official uh, church doctrine might be against abortion, there are theologians and philosophers of those religions who disagree. And therefore, the Supreme Court said, because it, it precisely because it is such a profound matter of personal ethics 
and morality. It is not the government's prerogative to interfere with that profoundly personal choice. In that sense, I think you could say that the right to choose could be rooted in First Amendment values of freedom of belief and freedom of conscience uh, and freedom of religion. In fact, John Paul Stevens, um, who was another Republican appointee to the court and himself a Republican, interestingly enough, he argued that anti-abortion laws should be struck down as violating the Establishment Clause, separation of church and state. Judge, did you want to uh, say anything on this? Any criminal law, any law at all, is rooted in morality and is rooted in religion. And if you extend that argument, it doesn't take us any place we want to go. Um, so far as Justice Blackmun's um, industry and seriousness, I admire them both. I just don't think that he was confirmed as a philosopher king. I, I wanted to ask you about FCC fairness doctrine um, to promote social discourse in, in a social manner that is like what we have today. Um, I'm an independent business owner. I was down at the state legislature today with a group. We were talking to both houses, uh, both sides of each house, and with data and personal experiences, both sides agreed with what we had for a bill to be moving forward. Because they had data, they had information, they were able to make that choice. It's difficult to do that nowadays with the internet and without the FCC, fairness compliance. And I just want to know if you think that's something that should be revisited. I don't think it's, I mean, it's, it's an admirable process that you described. I just don't think it's something you can legislate uh, because ultimately somebody is going to have to sit there and decide what, how much speech is required by fairness. And I'm against having such a person. And th th here we agree. Uh, I oppose the so-called fairness doctrine. It was very well intended. But what it, for those who might not know about this old rule, it required that when the broadcast media um, put aired uh, uh, one political perspective, they had to balance it with an opposite political perspective. And that gives so much power to government to decide what, in effect, is fair and balanced. The net result of it, ironically, it was whenever there's an issue of public concern, you have to present all perspectives. And it was so difficult to decide what were all the perspectives and to provide airtime for them that what happened was the network stopped covering pressing political issues altogether. So ironically, it had an impact of suppressing speech. But I do agree with Michael. The process that you've described, we have to, we have to bring about ourselves through our, building our own communities. All right, we have five minutes or four and a half minutes, so very quick questions and quick answers, if I may ask. Uh, so I'm a student here, I'm a Skettle major. And from what I've learned in some of my classes, the platonic view of like a good society is that they'll degrade over time and sometimes need truth re-injected into it. So how do we contend with the court um, making decisions on like the transgender ban, gay marriage, abortion, uh, that how do we reconvince the American people that the court's there to decide constitutional issues and not moral issues? <laughs> Uh, I, and, and okay, there I would go back to the fact that we have had throughout history, to the best of my knowledge, every single justice has agreed that there are some unenumerated rights that are protected. So the fact that they're not enumerated is not a justification for denying constitutional protection. Then we can debate on the merits of each particular issue whether it should be one of those. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think um, there are, uh, yes, there are unenumerated rights, but they are arrived at by a social consensus. Um, there is no, so, there has been no social consensus on abortion. Um, there is, for example, a social consensus on education. That developed early on. That, that developed, I should say, after, uh, the, after the Constitution was written. At the time the Constitution was written, there was no right to an education. Um, that developed to the point where there is a general recognition and a requirement 
that students get an education up until a certain point by certain standards. That became a right um, by consensus. Hi. Um, one issue that I've seen neither party really speak on much is the issue of prison reform. And um, I've seen just gross amounts of, you know, people not receiving the right care, the right food, um, and solitary confinement, and just other human atrocities. I just wanted to see what was your guys' perspective on that and what changes you'd like to see implemented. Well, this is an issue where fortunately there, for at least 10 years now, there has been huge bipartisan agreement and, um, and that has led to reform legislation most recently at the national level. One of the few things that uh, Congress has been able to do despite the gridlock and in many states. And here I think it's interesting that um, it's conservative Republicans who have really taken the lead in pushing through reforms because Democrats are afraid of being called soft on crime. So, you know, for those of us liberals who've been crusading for that forever, it's been wonderful to have conservative Republican allies and leaders. Yeah, I, I testify for that bill, and um, I, I think, however, that it's an experiment. Mm -hmm. um, and the outcome of the experiment is going to depend on what the recidivism rate is. If it goes down, or then, then it's a win. And I've been told we have time for one more question and to show that there's no favoritism. My son doesn't yeah. get his question. <laughs> yeah. um, but we have, a, we have a reception afterwards. So, you'll, so <clears throat> Julian, you're going to have a chance to ask our So yes, sir, ask please ask your question. Questions. I'm curious, in the case of Masterpiece Baker or these religious freedom laws that have proliferated around the states, to what extent does or should the court demand a memorialization of a religion and investigate the adherence to a religion? Or is the concept, it's my religious belief, a catch-all for anything? So for instance, I'm assuming a masterpiece baker was a Christian. He was re relying on Levitic, Leviticus 18.22. Is he adhering to all the rest of Levit Leviticus? Was he told, what is your religion? I'm curious, how, how do you deal with people who make religious freedom arguments like that? I'll speak only for myself and what the, what the law is. Uh, I believe very strongly it would be completely inappropriate and a violation of freedom of conscience for courts to uh, serve as arbiters of what the official religious position should be. And if you don't adhere to all of the tenets, then we're not going to allow you to follow the one tenet that you are espousing. So what courts have done is to say, we're not making those judgments. All we are asking is that the belief that's being asserted is sincerely held by that individual, even if he's the only person who belongs to that religion who asserts that particular belief. As long as it's sincere to him, we have to honor it. That doesn't mean that he's necessarily going to win, right? because it's not absolutely protected any more than freedom of speech is protected, but at least it's enough to implicate the right and to put the government to a burden of justifying the restriction. This matter was litigated uh, back in the dark ages when I was younger um, in, in, um, in, draft, in draft cases all the time where people claimed that they had a conscientious objection to serving. And those were litigated on the basis of evidence. You have to prove that you adhere to a, a conscientious position, uh, that you've adhered to it historically, and that it's not simply a matter of this particular occasion, and it was done more or less adequately in those cases. Well, with that, let me just make a few closing announcements, and then we do have a reception afterward. If you didn't get a chance to ask a question, you might find um, the judge or the professor and, and be able to pose a question. So all the students here who are present should make sure you get information from the schools website. We might have some information outside about our courses. We have a major, we have a minor. Um, we have a master's degree that's uh, coming in, in this coming academic year. We have, as I mentioned, a two-day conference in February, but we also have two further events in March and April. Walter Russell Mead to talk about polarization in foreign policy and Professor Danielle Allen from Harvard to talk about polarization and one remedy, uh, a new approach to civic education. Uh, so please find information outside and also on our website. Um, we have an event in the school for students this coming Tuesday the 5th, a sort of a career professional development um, event called Telling Your Story, 
to get your foot in the door. I think that's the title of it. Um, so look for information on our website about that. Again, thanks to our partners, uh, the Cronkite School, um, Arizona PBS, uh, the O'Connor College of Law. Thanks to our terrific events team, Dr. Carol McNamara, who's our Associate Director for Public Programs, and Catherine and uh, Taylor and Lauren and, other, and our student workers and other people I'm forgetting. Um, two things to uh, occupy your time during or after or in the middle of the reception. Don't forget our Civic Classics collection and thanks to our colleague from the library, Kathy Krish, who uh, takes these books on the road for us on campus and, and uh, off campus. Um, and also, um, as I mentioned before, Professor Strassen will have a, uh, a book signing, books available for purchase and to be signed for her book, Hate, Why We Should Resist It With Free Speech and Not With uh, Censorship. So, hope to see you at other events. Hope you enjoy the reception and join me one last time in thanking Judge McKaysey, Professor Strassen, and Professor Weinstein. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.